Indy has the same kill count as a professional assassin, <laughs> a psychopathic assassin. I see. I'm not a real archaeologist. <laughs> I just play one on TV. Give him hell, Indiana Jones! When your casting was announced, I was immediately drawing parallels between the indie franchise and Killing Eve, because mm -hmm. they are both globetrotting adventures mm -hmm. with mysteries to be solved. Was this like a secretly like a, the adventure film that was always on your bucket list that you kind of always wanted to take on in a way? I mean, <laughs> I'd always, I've, I grew up loving these movies. I grew up loving adventure movies, action movies, and anything to do with history and dust and caves and <laughs> awe and uncovering things. And, and um, but I, I, I'd never got to a place in my life or my career when I thought one day I'll be in an Indiana Jones film. <laughs> I didn't get that quite that far. But, um, but yeah, it, was, it really was a dream come true in so many ways. And in, in my research, it's just a little bit of trivia for y'all. Uh, Villanelle and uh, Indiana Jones have the same kill count. What? I know, right? They, they're both around like 40 yeah. people. Indy has the same kill count as a professional assassin. <laughs> <laughs> a psychopathic assassin. I see. Well, we took five films <laughs> right. to, to do it. <laughs> there were five series. <laughs> Actually, you did it in less time because the series is like eight hours. <laughs> but I think that I, I, I never killed, we never killed a, a good person. We mostly kill Nazis. That is fair. That is true. That That's is true. Fair. That same, is fair. same cannot be said for Jodie Comer, but um, not the not the person. Um, anyway, uh, <laughs> I hope. Um, I'll I, never reveal her number. <laughs> <laughs> what am I doing? I'm nervous. Um, <clears throat> we get the classroom, we get the flashback, we get the adventure, we get the twist. It has all of these elements, exactly what I wanted. Were there certain indie story elements that you were 100% adamant about including upon taking on the project? And were there any that you didn't get to? What you're after, first of all, is to try and capture the tone of all the movie, of all the best films or the ones you love in that series. And, and that involves all these ingredients. It's like, you know, it's like you're a chef in some ways as you think about trying to, you can't make everything, you can't do everything. But the other really interesting challenge in making uh, an Indiana Jones movie as indie ages isn't just the age of the hero, but is also the age or the time he's living in. One of the really wonderful aspects of the original first three films, I'd say, is they all take place between the 30s and the 40s. And so there's this incredible synergy between the kind of classical John Williams, take no prisoners, you know, uh, uh, Ernst uh, Corn gold esque score, between between Harrison, the dashing kind of hero with a touch of darkness in the, in the fedora, between Nazis and the war and the sense of good and evil so clearly, um, it's kind of a movie about movies and a movie about golden age movies. But as Harrison ages and the world changes and we enter a period of modernism, suddenly villainy isn't as clear anymore. I mean, we still live in a period of modernism, you know, real politic and triangulation and, and the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And, and it's not as clear anymore. Um, so it's harder, in a sense, to be that kind of hero. And so the one thing we had to tool or to try to figure out how to do is how to try and embrace that reality of the modern age and show how this hero might not fit so easily into this modern world as well as he did in that golden age world. And then, of course, finds his niche and proves himself once again. It was one of the main reasons I was really hell-bent to open with a very large sequence taking place in the 40s, was because I felt like before we confronted our audience with where Indy was in 1969, we had to somehow, I felt like I wanted, as a good chef, to continue the cooking, to offer you an appetizer that made you aware, we can do this, mm -hmm. we're gonna do this, but it's gonna be a journey till you're back to this kind of heroism again. This character is so complicated because uh, in the cold open, that opening scene, you don't even know if he's really a bad guy. You're kind of thinking like, I wonder if this is just something he got caught up in. You know what I mean? Like, there is a little bit of mystery to him. Dr. Jones, get him. You know, not unlike Indiana, his passion is for, for history and math. 
that's his passion. And, well, you couldn't go anywhere with that in, in Germany in the 30s. You had to be part of the party, right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think that the party grew on him. Um, mm. And, and uh, that was his downfall, because in the beginning he might have just been all math, all history. But it grew on him, and it, it grew too much. You've revived both of your big, iconic George Lucas characters. I mean, is this just a coincidence? Or what do you think it is about this dude and that point in time that allowed him to create these iconic characters that you would want to revisit? I'm not a real archaeologist. <laughs> I just play one on TV. So really, what I was given was a, a gift for any actor, a character with humor and and uh, and also some brains and some uh, just wonderful adventures to go on with fantastic characters like the character that uh, Phoebe plays. So for me, there's no, there's, you know, this is not me. This is me in collaboration with, with other people. I'm just a part of this. Uh, and it's been, look, it's been very, uh, uh, important in my career because it's helped me do all the other kinds of films that I enjoy doing. If your films are not successful, you, you're, there are limitations placed on you and we, this really helped me have a wonderful career. Well, you can write down on a piece of paper, Indiana Jones has charisma, but it's up to you to actually do that. You know what I mean? So don't sell yourself short there. I mean, <laughs> you, you did create the character in a lot He's of ways. Right. You were uh, you know, around like 18 when Raiders came out, right? So 17, actually. It's yeah. a great age for film because you're old enough to get it, but you still have the nostalgia. I was wondering uh, if there was like specific moments on set that gave you those uh, goosebumps? goosebumps moments where you were like this nostalgic, almost like, oh my God, full circle. Honestly, uh, the, the, uh, the way I should always answer these questions is just list you three moments and tell you I got goosebumps. But the, <laughs> but the reality is the weight upon my shoulders every day making a movie like this, you kind of have to wear almost a kind of Teflon shield from getting lost in that kind of fandom because you have such a strong job to do. So it happens, but it happens more in the cutting room and it happens more in the writing room. Meaning you kind of devise these moments and you get your own goosebump the first time you think of them or as they come together with the shots, but actually on set trying to get those pieces that are gonna be the movie, I feel incredibly focused, like I am, I'm a man on a mission, I need to get this done today and it needs to be the best it can be. And if I get too giggly over at the monitor, I'm gonna drop the ball is how I always feel. You stole it. Then you stole it. And then I stole it. It's called capitalism. It takes a big swing at the end, big swing, right? I loved it, totally paid off for me, right? But I was wondering if there was any part of you reading the script that was like, how are we gonna pull this off without going over the top? And was that like a concern to you at any point? Always. <laughs> <laughs> oh, terrified. No, I actually, when I read the script, I, uh, I was really moved by that ending and it felt completely like the natural place for the film to go. And I couldn't quite believe how they'd managed it. So I had all faith actually. Whereas you, you terrified? No, but I, I, you know, yes and no. I'm always concerned that that uh, that uh, we have the opportunity to do the best we can with with our part of the job. But you know, taking something from from the page, uh, something of such breadth, taking something from the page, and when you put a frame around it, it 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 almost defies reality so the things that are happening in that frame if it's real emotion if it's real joy if it's real concern for another person if it's real if the relationships are real that's what the audience feels they feel the real the reality of humanity and that carries them through some of these more uh unbelievable uh, experiences. Uh, what is it called? Like um, uh, removing your uh, belief of reality, suspending your belief. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's a thing. Because, you know, none of us have physically experienced that. And so we all <clears> have to, like, go with that leap and not judge it and not be out of the moment looking and watching it. The amount of storyboarding and animation that we were given on set with these iPads of, like, this is how it's going to go, shot for shot. Um, that's how well prepared these guys were 
to do that. And even Jim, I may have talking out of school, but he said, as it was happening at the uh, the can premiere, he's like, I hope this plays. <laughs> <laughs> really? And yeah, and it does. It's 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 fantastic. And I think it wraps up his whole archaeological ar uh, career too, of just kind of buttoning that up. I don't see this as a stretch. If you ask Einstein, we're closer to reality than any of the other films. Mm, I like that one. <laughs> I think also in, in the theme of, of time and, and the idea of aging and, and engaging with time and, and who we are in, in this world, I think uh, the scope of the film and then it was all appropriate, and, and as Matt said, it, I don't think it's too outlandish when you look at the history of what the franchise has, has been able to do. I was wondering if uh, there was a terror in you of worrying about going over the top with that, with that balance. Any of us who have worked on franchises, beloved franchises particularly, we, we obviously don't take them on unless we love the source material we're working with. And for me, Indiana Jones is one of the dearest and most inspiring characters and also a line of incredibly polished and beautiful films. Um, but one of the things you have to be aware of when you take on something like this is that these films have such a collective memory in our culture, in our psyches. And in some ways, we don't even necessarily remember them the same way they are. Um, I have to work with what they actually are. Meaning that when you ask me this question, the, the reason I took that little journey is because, you know, opening a chest and finding dark angels that fly out and kill 150 Nazis but leave our heroes alone as they swirl around and a great giant jet force goes into a cumulonimbus cloud sucking over an island doesn't exactly sound like a small swing for a movie that's existed m essentially magicless for the first two hours. And um, uh, um, people reaching into people's chests and pulling out their beating heart and uh, and massive voodoo um, insanity also and then certainly in Last Crusade finding a, a you know a ancient knight of the round table living in a cave the last 2,000 years you have chosen wisely each of them to me is a large swing and almost a staple of what the movies are but we're so used to those that we think of this swing as being so outsidedly large. But I have to tell you, because I was working with the creative principals who also worked on the other movies, none of us felt it was such a wild swing. It was merely, you have a relic, it's got a power, at some point that power is going to reveal itself. And I've been looking for this all my life. interesting he's like I want to kill Hitler and you're like oh yay and he's like oh to win the war and you're like oh no no no, no. <laughs> yeah, exactly yeah. Like, well we don't know why he wanted to so that's my escape oh so there is still kind of an air of mystery there he was a Nazi let's go <laughs> I got the whole um, American cinema goosebumps experience it was, oh man it was exactly what I wanted couldn't have asked for anything more I know that's it right <laughs>